Okay, uh, let's begin our session with uh, Umar Kitab Al-Fatihah. So, okay. Um, today is the second part of the procedure presentation, isn't it? And I've given you the topics. So, who, 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 who will be the presenter today? Uh, me, Zafira, and Akilah. Okay. All right. All right. Let, let's proceed. Let's proceed. Antara Zaf dengan Akilah, start dulu. Zaf nak start dulu tak? Okay, sekejap. Uh, boleh, boleh. Okay, uh, okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to Dr. Syed and my fellow friends. So, uh, can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, so um, today I will present uh, for the positive presentation. So, my part is about central venous access. So, there are several central venous access, uh, venous access centrally that can be done to the child. Uh, I, later I will ask, uh, I will explain more about it. So basically what we need to know is the first the indication of the central venous catheter. So central venous catheter it is done to the seriously ill ventilated patient especially with difficult peripheral venous access. And then the second one is hemodynamic monitoring such as we need to measure the central venous pressure and then for hemodialysis and then for long-term intravenous infusion, such as um, peripherally inserted uh, catheter, and then infusion, if irritant substance, uh, infusion of the irritant substance, such as vasoactive agents, calcium chloride and potassium chloride. And then the next one is the contraindication of the before we need to, before do before we do the central venous uh, catheter, we need to uh, assess the child first if there is any contraindication. So what is the contraindication? We first is the if because the central venous access is uh, quite difficult to to be done. So we need the trained doctors or nurses uh, to do this uh, uh, venous access. So if if there is absence of this doctor, so we it is contraindicated. And then if uh, the child is uncooperative, and then if the, there is a presence of coagulopathy or thrombocytopenia, so there is a risk of bleeding, so it's further deteriorate the patient. And then if uh, the veins are obstructed, the veins that we need to uh, insert, such as in, uh, femoral vein or subcular vein, is obstructed, so we cannot do the uh, central venous access. And then if the, uh, the site of the access is trauma, uh, there is presence of trauma such as clavicle fracture, so we cannot do it, especially for um, subclavian BMP. And then there is a burn site. And the last one, if uh, there is a risk, high risk of contamination at the Kenosian site later after we done the central venous, like uh, uh, such as in the femoral vein cannulation, so if there is risk of contamination by urine feces, so we need to avoid it first. And then we need to know what is the things that we need to prepare before we do the uh, before we do the central venous access. So before that, uh, the central venous access is done if especially uh, 
when I mentioned before, when the peripheral venous access are not uh, accessible and the, we need a uh, faster, uh, especially in the emergency situation for faster IV administration. So what this equipment set? So first, uh, so this is the equipment set for the central venous catheter, especially the um, femoral vein, cat uh, sacral vein and the jugular, internal jugular vein. So this is the basic, um, basic uh, set. So can you see my cursor? Okay. So the anti, uh, basically this antiseptic. So we need to, we need to have the antiseptic and then the steroid drip and half sheet and then uh, prepare the lidocaine for the local anesthesia and with a syringe and needle. And then uh, we need to prepare the nine lower lock shrink which we uh, for introducing of the needle later. And then introduce the needle, needle, uh, gut wire. This is a gut wire, scapel, but the, in our hospital, we use the scapel, the blade only lah, not the, this knife. Lah. Okay. Next is dilator. Uh, dilator, this is dilator. This is the introduce the and then uh, central venous catheter, triple lumen here. And then the suture material, steroid gas and titratum to secure the uh, central line. Okay. So first, uh, so these are the site for central venous. Um, the, uh, the femoral vein, sacral vein and internal jugular vein. And I will explain, I will add more about the peripherally inserted uh, central catheter later lah. and then okay this is only the sites so first i will explain on the femoral vein so the femoral vein so first of all we need to know the uh, anatomy of the femoral vein so we can insert uh, smoothly to the vein so actually the vein or artery is located at the you know, the femoral triangle. So we need uh, how to locate the femoral vein. So we need to uh, first uh, find the femoral artery or femoral pass. So because uh, femoral pass is about um, midway between the iliac crest and the symphysis pubis. So this is iliac crest and symphysis pubis. So the midline of it is femoral pass. So we uh, palpate there and the uh, femoral vein is located medial to the femoral artery. So you can see this is femoral artery and this is femoral vein. So medial of, it, of, medial of femoral artery is the femoral vein. So we can uh, insert the needle there. Okay, so this uh, basic anatomy of the femoral vein. So why before um, before that, so we need to know what is the advantage and disadvantage of the femoral vein compared to other uh, central line. So first, uh, femoral vein is uh, usually the most common uh, then in the children because uh, good access. And then it has a rapid access with high success rate. And it, it doesn't interfere with CPR um, because it not uh, uh, do it the chest or thoracic area and then it doesn't interfere with intubation and no risk of pneumothorax and then triadolumbate position was not necessary during the insertion and then uh, however there is advantage of the uh, febron data which is the is delayed secretion of drugs especially during CPR and then it prevents patient mobilization because uh, there is a uh, line stuck at the and then difficult to keep the site sterile because of uh, it is located uh, near the perineal region. So, and then next is difficult for pulmonary artery catheter incision. And the last one is increased risk of iliofemoral uh, thrombosis. Okay. So, uh, for the technique, so the technique I will uh, explain through the YouTube. Um, If 
pasangan ni nak kena re reshare screen balik. Ah ya. Share the whole screen. Okay, can you see the screen? Uh, so, so uh, this this uh, video is actually very long. So sometimes I will skip this, skip a some part of it. Mana? Tak gerak? Dia sekolah saya hijau pada tu. Okay. 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 So, can you see the sound? Okay, sekejap. So, first we need to, uh, especially we need to make the line, uh, the baby to find position and then the hip is slightly uh, abducted and abducted and externally rotated and then basically um, we need to put some towel uh, some towel uh, at the back of the babies to elevate the buttocks because it can be the vein can be more prominent so this uh, procedure is um, skin preparation so we sterile the we keep the side sterile the side of incision sterile so this I skip this and then we put the sterile drip uh, to and then we only uh, expose the area that we need to insert the line. So we prepare the equipment um, before, uh, prior to the incision so it is easy to uh, insert the femoral line. So this is the equipment. And then we need to monitor, uh, we need to connect the patient to monitor to know is there is any hemodynamic instability later. So next, we insert the needle. And while inserting the needle into the femoral vein, so before this procedure happen, we need to palpate the pus. So uh, we need to palpate the pus and uh, middle to it is the femoral vein. So we insert the needle at that. Uh, side lah, femoral to, eh, needle to the femoral artery. So and then we insert the needle and while inserting the needle, we advance uh, the needle uh, uh, sambil tarik, uh, uh, pull the strings, uh, aspirate the strings to know is the, um, there is a uh, blood written. So after blood is written, so we advance more but and then we secure the needle uh, and then we insert the gut wire. So and then the gut wire is uh, properly placed in the central, in the femoral vein. And so this, technique, the, this technique is called Seldinger technique. Eh? So where you you put a you put a larger 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 catheter larger lumen catheter first, and then you pass through gut wire into it, and then you with the gut wire you dilate the you dilate the area that you want to insert, and then only you you insert the proper. So this technique is called selling the technique. All right, all right, proceed, proceed. Okay. So next we remove the needle and. Uh, make sure the gut wire is in place at that time and then and then the doctor insert the dilator to make the size of the incision bigger to, in, to insert the femoral line catheter and use a blade to to make the smooth incision in, incision And then, if, and then after that, we after there is a good enough of uh, incision, 
So we remove the dilator. And then insert the femoral line catheter into the femoral vein. Don't forget you need to flush first eh, the catheter. So if you don't flush, there'll be air in it, in the, in the femoral catheters. If you don't flush, there'll be air in it and then you may introduce air embolism. So you need to flush it first. Flush all the lumens. Okay, all right, all right, flush it. So next, uh, and then after that, the gut wire we remove and uh, the camera line catheter is remains at that side lah. And then there is, you can see, there is a black written to indicate uh, uh, insertion to the femoral vein lah. And then, and then the doctor will flash the, the each of the line. So next, uh, the doctor will fix the catheter uh, by suturing by suture. And then after suture time, we can dress the femoral uh, catheter with a targeting or dressing. So that is the technique of the femoral vein line incision. And that's it. So that's it for the femoral uh, venous access. So I proceed next for the next central venous access. What's the problem with femoral lines? Mm, the, the problem one is the risk of uh, contamination around the perineal area. Yep, like it. So because the perineal, perineal region is very near to your babies, they wear diapers, isn't it? So sometimes it may contaminate with poo and, and, and others. So other problem? Hmm. If uh, there is complication whereby uh, hmm, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Anyone else? Siapa yang nampak macam bersedia nak jawab ni? Solhi tengah sengih. Ha. Cepat, dia orang sengih dia tahu jawapan. What else? Problem with femoral lines. Dandan aklan cover mulut. Hmm. Cepat, Solhi. Um, operator dependent. Operator. Pendan, okay. Ha, Aklan, cepat. Trombosis ada? Ha? Oh, trombosis saya. Trombosis, anyway, can cause trombosis lah eh. Either femoral thrombosis tu. What I'm thinking about is actually injury to the bowel eh. So, sometimes you <coughs> you use in the technique that, that uh, siapa? Zafira. Zafira showed just now, they use needle tu. Introduce a needle. But here, in our setting, we don't usually use introduce a needle. Why? Sebab the set is the set itself is expensive, and we charge patient when we use it. So, in in HTA in government hospital also the the set, uh, the the set is limited. So we don't usually open the set immediately. 
So what we do is we use a larger bore uh, cannula. Cannula biasa tu, we use larger bore. Contohnya yang blue color eh. Blue color ni berapa? 22G. Kan? 22 gauge uh, cannula. So we use that cannula first. Lepas tu baru kalau dah masuk, we sure that it is in the femoral vein. Baru kita masukkan guide wire. Baru kita buka set, kita ambil guide wire, kita masukkan guide wire. Macam tu. Supaya kita nak jimat cost. Because sometimes you can't get into the vein. Okay, so <coughs> So problem dia sometimes bila kita use large, larger bore uh, uh, cannula ataupun even if you use the introducer needle sometimes you may you may push in too deep and you know after the inguinal canal is your peritoneum so sometimes there may be peritoneal injury you may cause uh, you may cause cellulitis you may cause bowel perforation as well i've seen some they do they they puncture it too deep and it cause bowel perforation as well So these are among the problem. And also the other problem is when you puncture the artery. So you should actually puncture the vein but you puncture the artery and then you're giving medication to the artery and this can cause uh, obstruction and cause limb ischemia and so on and so forth. Okay, all right, proceed. Okay, next I will explain on the next uh, central line that we can give to the child. Um, First, first uh, next is subclavian vein access. So what is the advantage of subclavian vein compared to others? Um, it is easier to maintain the vessel because it's located at the uh, slavic area. Then it's more comfortable to the patient. And better landmarks in the obese patient and accessible when airway control is being uh, established. However, this, this, uh, this advantages of the subclavian vein access is increased risk of pneumothorax because uh, the site of incision that uh, we do in the subclavian vein line is uh, basically uh, near to the apex of the lungs, especially at the first rib. So it is a uh, risk of pneumothorax. And then procedure related breathing, less amenable to direct pressure. And then decrease success rate with inexperienced uh, doctors or the one that did the uh, line. And then longer path for skin to vessel. Mm. And then the catheter my position is more common, especially uh, to the right uh, superior vein, uh, uh, to the right subclavian vein, because it can direct into the right atrium. And then interference with uh, chest compressions and the last one is risk for stenosis or occlusion which impacts the future hemodialysis as trebinous assess. So, hmm, I forgot <laughs> the anatomy uh, of the subclavian vein. So it's basically the subclavian vein is located posterior uh, to the medial, medial portion of the clavicle. So you can see Mm, this is the clavicle part, the middle part, so it is located posteriorly. And then the, uh, and then to the <laughs> subclavian artery is located posterior to the vein. So, belakang daripada subclavian vein is the subclavian artery. So, the risk of artery injury also uh, high in this uh, approach. Mm, and then, So there is the infraclavicular approach and the supraclavicular approach for the subclavian vein incision. Uh, so for first for the infraclavicular approach, we we uh, we insert the needle at the one to two cm inferior to the junction of the proximal and middle third of clavicle. So this is the uh, this is the clavicle. So the proximal and middle third. So the you can see the hand is actually Uh, where the needle will be put. So this infraclavicular approach. And then we insert the needle uh, towards, uh, directed towards the sternal notch, which is here, sternal notch. So macam parallel to it lah. And then the supraclavicular approach, we insert the We insert the needle superior to the clavicle. This is clavicle and then Superior it and 1 cm lateral to the uh, sternal cradle mus uh, muscle, uh, clavicular head here, so the lateral of it. So basically around here lah, insertion site for the supraclavicular approach. 
but um, usually the infraclavicular approach is the most common detail. Hmm. And then the technique, so first of all we need to place the chair in the trendelenburg position uh, whereby we placing the head of the patient lower compared to the feet. So I will share the, the technique. So basically, the first, the skin preparation and uh, the sterile uh, preparation is basically the same as before, like the femoral vincator, and then there is sensation of the local anesthetic. So I uh, will jump into the how uh, the line is fitted. Okay, jangan balik doktor. <laughs> okay. Ini kat hostel ke kat rumah ni? Hostel. Tapi kita sama lambat sikit tu. <laughs> okay lah, tak apalah. Subclavian, basically subclavian eh. We don't do in pits lah. Hmm. We don't do in pits. The risk of pneumothorax is very very high. So we don't do in pits. I've not seen any hospital that do subclavian uh, characterization in pediatrics, uh, not in HTA, not in SASMAC definitely, not in uh, HOSHAS, not in USM, not in HRPZ. So don't do subclavian vein. There's other veins that are better to use. Okay, let's proceed with the next then. <laughs> Sorry, doctor. Um... Basically, the procedure is the same by the setting ke teknik. So, we insert the introducer needle and then you get wire and then the later, next. I, I have explained the technique. Uh, for, uh, I have write the technique. You can read later. Okay. okay, next is the internal jugular vein. So, internal jugular vein, so the insertion of the uh, central vein uh, character is in, in internal jugular vein. So, where the anatomy of internal jugular vein, it is located between the uh, clavicular head clavicular head and sternal head of sternal clavicular muscle, uh, muscle. So this is internal jugular vein, this is external jugular vein. So we really insert into the internal jugular vein. So basically this is the anatomy of the internal jugular vein. Hmm. And then, uh, so uh, basically how to know where is the internal jugular vein uh, in the face anatomy. So we need to palpate first the carotid artery. So and then after we palpate the carotid artery, so the lateral of lateral of the carotid artery is basically is the internal jugular vein. Or oh, we can see the we can say it's the um, uh, middle uh, no uh, middle edge of the sternal Middle edge of the sternal, middle edge of the sternal, clavicle, sternal head of the sternal. Sternocleidomastoid sterno, sterno, sterno muscle. Ah, sterno muscle. So your sternocleidomastoid sterno, sterno muscle tu, 
dia dia ada dua limb kan satu dia both daripada mastod bone uh, mastod bone daripada mastod bone tu nanti dia ada dua kan satu pergi ke sternum satu pergi ke your clavicle so cladel is clavicle lah so basically it's the medial aspect medial aspect of the of the sternocleidal muscle uh, sternocleidal muscle uh, muscle tu so and the thing you need to remember is femoral line vein is medial to artery but uh, internal jugular vein is lateral <laughs> lateral to the carotid artery okay. Okay, so what is the advantage of the transgular vein? It is minimal risk of pneumothorax, so especially if you ask uh, antrosan guidance. It is compared to uh, subclavian vein uh, access. And then head of table access. Then procedure related bleeding amenable to direct pressure. And then lower failure with novice operator. And next advantage is excellent, um, good with uh, antrosan guidance. And then that the disadvantages of the uh, internal jugular vein approach is not ideal for the prolonged access and then risk of a carotid artery puncture if do not insert properly and then it's very uncomfortable to the patient is because it around the neck and the face and then dressing and catheter difficult to maintain um, and then can have a possible thoracic duct injury if we do at the left side and then poor landmarks in all best or edematous patient, potential access and maintenance issue with concomitant tra tracheostomy. Mm, and then vein, vein, the intergular vein prone to collapse if the patient hypovolemic. And then it is difficult access during emergency when airway control be accepted. So mm, that is uh, complicated around the neck area. And then there are three approach, which anterior, central, and posterior approach. So the anterior approach is basically, like I have mentioned before, it is uh, the needle will be inserted lateral to the carotid artery, medial edge of sternal belly of the sternocleidal muscle. And this is the anterior approach. And then the central approach, it is um, at the superior apex of triangle of sternocleidal mastoid muscle so we you can see, you can remember the anatomy there is a right triangle there so there is superior apex so it is central approach and the last one is the posterior approach which is along uh, lateral edge of sternocleidal mastoid muscle the commonly that is the anterior approach so basically the technique is still the same as the sacrovi artery Mm -hmm. And then we need to put the patient in the triangle position and might have an extension of the next to permit the better visualization of the landmarks. Okay, few problems with uh, with uh, jugular catheterization, internal jugular catheterization. One is, you know, you're accessing the neck. So children, especially infants, newborns, they don't have neck. Neck is very small, right? Yeah? They don't have neck. So the, the area that you can access is very, they, they, they do have neck, but neck is small, right? Yeah? So uh, the area that you can access is very limited. The second thing is, the, 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 the distance eh, from, from the insertion side to the, basically you don't want the tip going into the right atrium. You want it to be just above. You want it to be at the SVC area, isn't it? So that distance is, is quite short. That distance is quite short. And then you remember, uh, kalau you put the, the catheter all the way inside, the catheter will go very deep in. Dalam heart dia. You don't want that to happen. So sometimes you need to pull out. Bila you pull out, catheter yang kat luar tu Panjang. So the more catheter yang panjang, you nak kena coil kan, you nak kena modify kan. So getting it secure and clean is a bit difficult and tricky. Uh, so that's the the problem. Okay. And remember juga with all this central venous catheter, what happens if you insert it into the right atrium? What can happen? Arrhythmia. Arrhythmia. Kenapa jadi arrhythmia? Uh the sinatria node as a node as a node yes mm -hmm. because i've seen people i've seen cases 
bila kita start bagi dia on dia on TPN bila dia on TPN sebab dia slow infusion kan tak ada effect tak ada effect sangat the moment kita bagi antibiotik dia bola sikit macam tu kan tiba-tiba dia berhak dia naik bila kita stop dia stabilize balik each time kita bagi bolus medication dia hari dia naik macam tu and when we look at the x-ray the problem is actually the tip of the central catheter ni is just at the is in the RA near the SA node in region so this is a problem that you need to you need to take note Okay, proceed, proceed. So, proceed to the video or proceed to the next? Proceed to the next lah. Yeah. Video sama okay. je. Okay. Sama <laughs> je. So, basically the same. The next, uh, the last one is the peripherally inserted central catheter or we can say PICC. What is or, or, orang kampung panggil long line lah. Oh, long line. Because it's long. Okay, so uh, so what what is the purpose of PICC line or advantages of the PICC line is uh, it allow the medication or nutrition support if it's not suitable by standard IV line peripheral access. And then um, it also good uh, to give a medication like long-term chemotherapy and then total parental nutrition so it good to be given at the uh, via the PICC line. And then it is simple and painless and then it's fair the patient the, this, uh, the patient will be not discomfort because of repeated needle punches because we only insert once and only at the peripheral side and then it can use uh, for medicines that uh, irritate the wall of the pain and then it can be placed or be removed back side or out back in the outpatient setting so we don't need to do in a proper place like operating room like that mm. and then however the disadvantages of uh, the PICC line it is not uh, we use after if the treatment that we want to do is uh, more than two weeks, however, it cannot um, be inserted very long for more than six months. And then, because it inserted peripherally, so may have incidental damage or removal uh, towards the if there is an uh, inadequate securing or placement of the peripheral line, uh, peripheral, this PICC line. So basically, we insert the PICC line first either through the first through the brachial vein or cephalic vein or basilic vein and then it will <laughs> and then it will uh, go through into the axillary and subclavian vein and goes to superior vena cover and then this is what this is like uh, the PICC line mm -hmm. so the equipment set for the PICC line is a quite different from the central venous catheter before a central venous architecture before so there is a long line here this is a PICC set and then the echogenic needle mm, the gut wire the peel away introducer the shrink the cap uh, the uh, the cap the operator the measuring tip the scalpel that lot screw manifest or we can see this is the tegatum this is uh, what I get from the uh, overseas proceed, uh, overseas hospital. So it's not, I'm not sure it's the same. Okay, Malaysia. So um, this is the technique. So the technique. Yeah. So it's good to use ultrasound to confirm the place of the pain. And then local anesthetic. Okay. 
So we use the the list there. Please get away here. So basically, I forget to mention that before we before we want to insert the line, so we need to measure the the measure the um, measure the length of uh, how the length from the antiquity paper to the superbrainer cover to know the exact line to be inserted later for the PICC line. So if um, the PICC line uh, that has been provided is long, longer than supposed to be, so we need to trim. You see that, dia pakai peelable needle tu Basically sebab dia puncture with that needle Kan, lepas tu baru masuk guide wire Lepas tu baru masuk dilator uh, So, with the peelable needle tu, it's much easier lah So, maknanya you, you puncture and then you boleh Buka kan You, you patahkan dia punya needle tu So, that, that's good as well The technique is basically the same They are all using Seldinger technique But PICC this this technique this is this is untuk orang besar lah. Eh. In children we don't do like this lah. Uh, we don't we seldomly need to give uh, uh, local uh, for long line in, in children because usually we use much smaller punya uh, much smaller punya punya uh, catheter. We use uh, kalau pre extreme premature baby we use one French punya size and then in in bigger bigger babies we use two French. In children punya pediatric age group, sometimes we use just three French or four French. Sometimes rarely we use five French, but not bigger than that. So, semua-semua tu is quite small lah. It's quite small. So, uh, again, usually 
kalau kita guna one French punya size, we can even use the you know yang yellow punya 26 gauge punya uh, punya catheter tu, yang yellow punya catheter tu kan. 26 gauge tu we just use that. The puncture yang tu and then kalau yang tu pun boleh masuk uh, guide wire. Uh, and then uh, sometimes kita boleh guna kita boleh mana kalau yang jenis yang one French sometimes dia tak ada guide wire. So we just puncture using the usual cannulation technique. And then daripada cannula tu kita pass through dia punya one French punya catheter boleh pass boleh pass through. Cuma the problem with PICC ni first is to get a proper is to get a good vein tu sometimes it's quite difficult. Dalam you punya presentation tadi you mention biasanya pasang pada break, uh, 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 brachial or brachial cephalic vein kan, or basilic vein. Cuma Again, these are all bigger, bigger adult or bigger children lah. So basically, in in uh, if you look at newborns, we put it basically anywhere lah. I I've I've seen people using the small veins, the the veins here. I've seen uh sometimes uh among the easiest uh place to put is actually in your saphenous vein, yeah, the kind ankle too, uh near the middle, just in front of your medial malleolus. This is your saphenous vein. So saphenous vein is another good site for for a uh, long line but sub, lower limb long lines are only for newborns bigger children adult kita tak buat lower limb kenapa tak buat lower limb it's long the is very very long lah very very long jauh jauh bukan main lagi kan so we don't we don't do lah uh, basically in bigger children and also in adults we don't do lower limb punya long line So uh, adults, uh, bigger children, we use only upper limb punya long line. But in newborns, in infants, sometimes we can consider lower uh, lower limb punya long line. We need to measure lah. Uh, we need to know where the measurement. So we measure again, it should be until the SVC or near the uh, IVC, near the heart already. Okay, alright. Anything else? Zafira. Uh, lastly is the complications. Ngantuk lah Jazli tu. Okay, next. Next one is the complication of the central venous uh, catheter. So, this is the general. So, first the immediate. So, because of we insert the needle and then it cause, can cause bleeding. And if we do not, if we uh, miss the coagular petty patient, so can cause more bleeding. And then atrial puncture, like carotid puncture or femoral atrial puncture. And then the arrhythmia that I already mentioned before. Mm. And then next one is the air embolism because of, especially like I, Dr. Hay mentioned because of large pore catheter. <coughs> so that's why um, uh, Treadal Lambert position is good for to reduce the risk of air embolism. And then next one is thoracic duct injury, especially if we do at the left subcabin or the left internal jugular approach. So that's why we prefer more of, uh, to do at the right side. And then the catheter mark position, um, maybe we insert like uh, supposedly at the super uh, venous cover, we advance more to the right atrium, so it's not good. And then lastly, for the immediate complication is pneumothorax or hemothorax, especially for the subclavian vein approach. And for the late complication, uh, one is infection, the just catheter related bloodstream infection, and then venous thrombosis or pulmonary emboli because there is a uh, turbulent flow around there that can cause uh, thrombosis. Mm, and then stenosis, venous stenosis. Mm, and then catheter malfunction because of uh, maybe inadequate flow or sometimes there is thrombosis too can cause the catheter malfunction and then catheter malfunction like supposedly it is located at the inferior uh, superior vena cava ever later uh, after few months it migrate towards down uh, it migrates downwards into the right atrium and then catheter embolization Uh, next is uh, next one is myocardial perforation, especially if the tip of the catheter is inserted into the right atrium, so later it can be can puncture the uh, wall of the heart. And the last one, the last complication for the late complication is the nerve injury. If we um, nerve injury, 
So that is uh, for the central venous access from me. Okay, uh, just just few things that I want to add. Uh, basically, uh, the one that Zafira has presented are all the basically temporary sort of lines, kan? So, femoral subclavian. Subclavian don't do in pediatrics. Eh? Uh, you consider femoral or, or uh, internal jug only or PICC. Generally, PICC is more preferable but it is more easily secured. Kalau neck, dia ber besar kat sini. Budak nak gerak kepala pun susah. Kalau femoral, Uh, biasa kalau adapt dia letak femoral dia nak jalan berus tapi kalau cedera nak ada femoral pun dia jalan gedah aje but then it's difficult because of nappy and thing so and it can be a bit messy budak-budak kadang-kadang dia tengok benda gantung dia main tarik dia pelepak dia tarik kan i've seen cedera macam tu lah dia bukan tahu benda tu apa kan nampak benda tu gantung kat kulit dia sap dia tarik kan so i've seen cedera do, do, do that the best is actually PICC So because PICC ni, you can secure it nicely, you can cover it properly, so it is much more secure. The problem with PICC is, it's very difficult for you to take blood. Sebab in adults, you you use larger bore punya catheter, larger larger lumen punya PICC. But in children, you use one French, two French. These are all very small. One French ni is very, very small punya lumen. So, bila you use one French, you tak boleh ambil blood. Kalau you ambil blood, dia akan block. So that's the problem. So so it's not suitable for blood taking. Secondly is it's not permanent lah. So sometimes you you should uh, if you if you need to use it longer, you need to change every 14 days for example. So few of the permanent type of catheter that you can use are the one I've chat in the in the chat lah. So you can use something such as the Hickman line. So Hickman line dia sama je dengan dengan internal jug punya ni. Tapi it's more of permanent. So it's a surgically inserted by surgeon or by radio intensivist lah. Radiological intensivist macam Pro Razali. So they can do that or or you can put a potacat lah. Chemopod. Chemopod ni sometimes for 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 chemotherapy so semua we use chemopod. Okay. Alright. Let's go to the next. Thank you. Wait. Uh, can you give me one minute? Ada, ada. I just nak, nak tunjuk satu. Kejap, kejap. Eh. Give me, give me one minute. We, 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 we'll pause for, for. Sorry, sorry, again. Eh. Sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm trying to juggle with so many things. Uh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So my name is Nur Akhil Yunus, and today I'll be presenting about umbilical catheterization. So when talking about umbilical catheterization, there is two types of catheterization. First is umbilical artery catheterization and second is umbilical vein catheterization. So uh, here is a diagram uh, of a fetus collation. So as you can see, here is the placenta and connected to the placenta is the umbilical cord. And in the umbilical cord, there are two umbilical arteries with one umbilical vein. So here is the umbilical vein which will uh, bypass the portus collation via the ductus venosus and connected to the inferior vena cover before it enters the right atrium. So here is the pathway if we would like to insert umbilical vein catheter. Uh, and in umbilical vein catheterization, we would aim to insert the catheter uh, until the area of inferior vena cava. Meanwhile, for the umbilical artery, it actually comes, uh, you guys can see my cursor, right? It actually comes from the internal iliac artery, right and left, respectively, internal iliac artery, uh, from common iliac artery and from aorta. So uh, here is a picture of uh, umbilical cord and umbilical cord. As I mentioned, there are two umbilical arteries and one or single umbilical vein. And the umbilical vein is usually located at the 12 o'clock. Meanwhile, the umbilical arteries at the 4 o'clock and also 8 o'clock respectively. And umbilical vein would have thin wall with large lumen. Meanwhile, the umbilical artery will uh, have thick wall and also a smaller lumen. So here's a real picture of the umbilical cord. Here is the umbilical vein. And uh, there are one umbilical artery here and also one umbilical artery here at 4 o'clock and also 8 o'clock respectively. In a real umbilical cord, the umbilical artery would appear constricted and also uh, whitish in appearance. A bit whitish because it is constricted. So first I'll talk about umbilical artery catheterization. So umbilical artery catheterization or we can say UAC uh, to simplify. 
which is an invasive procedure and should be done under supervision in, in an NICU setting. So the indication for umbilical catheterization is for repeated blood sampling in ill newborn, especially those on ventilator, and also occasionally UAC is used for continuous BP monitoring and also infusion. So there are contraindications to umbilical catheterization, and uh, the one most important contraindication to umbilical catheterization is actually local vascular compromise in the lower extremity. Why? Because uh, as we can see later, that umbilical catheterization it can actually cause uh, thromboembolism or vascular spasm at the area of incision, so it can cause lower limb vascular insufficiency as a complication. Therefore, uh, before we proceed with umbilical catheterization, we have to check for any evidence of lower limb vascular insufficiency before we insert the UAC. Other contraindication would be uh, other infection, for example, peritonitis or necrotizing enterocolitis or even omphalitis. Omphalitis is the infection of inflammation of the umbilical cord. So these are the equipments that we need. First, we need the UAC set. Then we need the umbilical artery catheter. So here is the umbilical artery catheter with appropriate size uh, accordingly. In term infant, we'll use size 5 French. Meanwhile, in uh, infant of 1,500 gram and below, we'll use the size 2.5 French. And uh, at the umbilical catheter, there's actually a marking, marking uh, in centimeter, uh, marking in centimeter. Uh, for us to see how deep have we inserted the umbilical catheter. Later, we will uh, look at how deep should we insert the umbilical artery catheter. There, are, there is a calculation for it. At, uh, apart from that, we also need a 5cc syringe, which is filled with heparin as a line. As doctor has mentioned, before prior to insertion, we have to like flush the umbilical artery catheter with heparin as a line uh, to ensure that there is no air remain in the catheter. Otherwise, it can lead to air embolism. And we also need other set of hyperinacid line for infusion, for continuous infusion later. And also need a three-way tap or three-way stop call. So before procedure, as I have mentioned earlier, one of the complications, significant complications, actually lower limb vascular insufficiency, secondary to vascular spasm or secondary to thromboembolism. So before procedure, we have to examine the infant's lower extremities and also buttocks for any signs of vascular insufficiency. We have to palpate the femoral pulse for their presence and equality and also evaluate the infant's legs, feet and toes for any asymmetrical in color, visible bruising or any signs of vascular insufficiency. For example, any pale color uh, extremities, any cold extremities and so on. I'll also check for the capillary review time. And then we should document the findings for later comparison post-procedure. And if we see, if there is any sign of vascular insufficiency, insufficiency we should not insert the umbilical artery catheter. So, for the procedure, uh, it should be done under aseptic technique. So, first we should clean the umbilicus and also the surrounding area using the standard aseptic technique. Uh, we should consider exposing the feet in term babies if the field of sterility is adequate because while we are performing the umbilical artery catheterization, we should observe for any signs of limb ischemia during the procedure itself. And then, uh, here is the example. This is the umbilical cord. So we will hold the stump gently. We hold the stump. We hold the stump. And then we would cut. We make a cut uh, at the umbilicus horizontally, about 1 cm, uh, leaving 1 cm of stump from the abdomen. So 1 cm and then we cut over there. Uh, however, when we want to cut the stump or the umbilicus, uh, we should not pull the stump too tight or too taut before cutting it. Because if we pull it too tight or too taut, then uh, after cutting, we will end up with the arteries being protruded 2 mm beyond the umbilical jelly itself. And this will make successful cannulation more difficult. And after cutting the umbilicus horizontally, we will locate the umbilical artery, uh, as I have mentioned earlier. In a fresh and untwisted umbilical stump, the two arteries can actually be clearly distinguished from the vein because it is smaller in diameter, it would appear more white and also constricted. And then we will hold the stump upright with your fingers or artery forcep and then we will take a probe or uh, easily we can take forcep to gently and patiently dilate the lumen of the artery before we insert the catheter. And then ideally if uh, to make your cannulation easier, if you are right-handed, you should stand to the left side of the baby and during the incision, we should direct the catheter posteriorly and also inferiorly in the direction of the lower limb. Because, uh, because as you know earlier, that the umbilical artery will first uh, have, it should enter first the internal iliac artery 
before it then should curve upward uh, to enter at the area of descending iota. Uh, later I'll show an X-ray of the correct position and the electrical transition. Okay. So uh, after that, we need to categorize the umbilical artery to the desired position. So there is a formula uh, of how deep should we insert the umbilical artery transition. So there are two uh, formula. The much preferred is the high position formula in which the tip will be located above the diaphragm between T6 and also T9. Uh, meanwhile, the lower position is no longer recommended right now. It is mentioned that the high position of UAC is associated with a lower risk of complications. So how do we calculate this, uh, the length in which we should insert the UAC? First, we'll take the birth weight of the infant in kg, in kilogram, times with 3, plus 9, plus the stump length. Uh, the stump length means the stump, the length of the stump that is left after we cut it earlier. If we cut it earlier at 1 cm, then we add 1 cm. If we cut it earlier at 2 cm, then we add on 2 cm accordingly. And if it's in the low position, which is no longer recommended right now, the formula would be sim much simpler. You'll take the birth weight in kg, just plus with 7 centimeters. Uh, and theoretically, the distance between the umbilical artery at the level of the abdomen, when it enters the abdomen, into the internal iliac artery in which it branches from, it takes about 7 cm. So to push it, to put it in the descending iota, it has to be more than the 7 cm. And then after cannulation or catheterization, we should ensure the successful and correct cannulation of the one umbilical artery. So in a successful catheterization of umbilical artery, the blood withdrawn should be bright red because uh, it should be oxygenated at that point of time. And also we can see visible artery repulsation in the column of blood which we draw into the catheter. However, uh, there are cases, for example, in very preterm babies or babies in shock, we could not see this pulsation. Hmm. However, it is still an umbilical artery. However, we cannot visualize clearly the artery pulsation because patient is in shock or patient is very preterm. And in the case of accidental so, 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 so in, in this sort of patient, how do you confirm whether it's artery or vein? Uh, we can check for the oxygenation of the. Okay, so you can send you can send the sample for blood gas. So if you see the PO2 is high, PCO2 is low, it's artery. If the PO2 is low and CO2 is high, so you know it's vein. How else you can see? Any other way you can see? Whether you can assess whether it is venous or arterial? You can do the post procedure X ray. Oh, okay, okay, fine, but that will take time. So the easiest one of one of the easiest thing for you to assess is actually you just uh you 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 expose the can you see my video? Okay, uh, can you see me? Okay, so you just open up the the hub. When you open up the hub, what, what's going to happen is if you put the the, the 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 tip of the catheter up, if if it's arterial, it will go up. The, 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 the blood will slowly go up against gravity. Venus, if it's if it, the blood will go down with gravity. So when you when you put the catheter down uh, at the same level as the heart, and then you will see the blood starts to flow back. This is Venus. When you put it up against gravity, the the blood will slowly go down. So this is Venus. If arterial, if you put it up against gravity, it will still go up. So that's the easiest way actually to assess venous or arterial. Okay, all right, that's it. Okay. Uh, and at times, uh, in the case of accidental cannulation of the umbilical vein, uh, we can um, we can also get accidental blood if the catheter tip uh, accidentally entered the umbilical vein uh, and it goes right up in the inferior vena cava into the Right at, uh, into the right atrium and then it pass through the foramen ovary to the left atrium. Uh, in this case, we may be mistaken. We thought that this is an artery, however, it is not. And then, after confirming the correct the correct catheterization of umbilical artery, uh, we should stick the label of the catheter onto the patient's folder for future reference. We should note the brand and also the material of the catheter because uh, in the event of limb ischemia or thrombosis, which, will, which can occur later on, we have the documented which character that we use and which brand also which material. And 
Also, we uh, after post procedure, we have to observe for signs of artery ischemia to the lower limb and buttock due to atrial spasm. As I have mentioned earlier, we assess the color, uh, either it is pale or not, either it is cold. Uh, we assess for the capillary refill time, whether it is delayed more than two seconds, and we also assess the dorsal speedies and also posterior tibial pulses. If there are no complications, then we can secure the UAC to avoid accidental dislodgement. So here is for the post procedure, what we have to do. First, we have to perform a chest and also abdominal x-ray to ascertain the placement of the UAC tip. And the preferred placement, as I've mentioned earlier, is the high position between the T6 to T9 vertebra. So uh, this is an example of uh, an umbilical artery catheterization, which is properly placed. Here you can see that this is the umbilical artery catheterized catheter in which it will enter here. First, it will enter inferiorly and enter the uh, internal iliac artery before it then curve outward, upward uh, in cephalic uh, direction uh, until it reaches the area which is desired above the diaphragm at the area of T6 to T9 here. And this is an example of umbilical artery differentiation which is... One thing, if you can see, uh, in, in the previous extent, you cannot see clearly. Sepatutnya in, in UAC, it will go down first and then it will loop up. As compared, if you see here, kalau venous kan, they go straight. It will go straight. Kalau, kalau artery, they can go down first and then they look back up. Okay, proceed, proceed. So this is just uh, an example of misplaced uh, umbilical artery catheter in which it enters the, at the femoral artery here. So in the case of uh, malposition uh, catheter, we can try to manipulate However, uh, we can withdraw the catheter to the correct position. However, uh, we sh should avoid pushing it in to maintain the sterility because we know the distal pipe has been contaminated, right? Uh, not aseptic. So we should avoid pushing in the catheter, but we can withdraw the catheter. And also, every two to four hourly, we should monitor the lower limb and also buttock area for ischemic changes and infuse heparin and saline continuously through the UAC uh, at a rate of 0 0.5 to one unit per hour to reduce the risk of catheter occlusion and thrombotic events. Also, uh, daily, we have to check for the catheter migration by measuring the catheter length marking every day and compare it with the initial length at the point of time in which we insert the UAC. And finally, we should remove the UAC as soon as no longer required to reduce the incidence of thrombus formation and also long line sepsis. So this is among the complications. Uh, bleeding can occur in, in occasion whereby there is accidental disconnection or open connection for example the three three way uh, stop cock uh this not this not close it's not close so it forms an open connection bleeding can occur there and if we do not uh, properly flush the catheter with fibronisaline there could be air emboli or if any blood clot form inside the catheter it can also from thrombus in which then it can embolize to other artery. And as a response or as a consequence of artery catheterization, sometimes uh, there is also um, a condition that can develop is vasospasm, vascular spasm or thrombosis. So depending on the site in which it is affected, if it affects the renal artery, patient can present hypertension, hematuria and also renal failure. Uh, if for example, it affects the mesentery artery, it can cause gut ischemia or even necrotizing enterocolitis. Among other complications are vascular perforation of the umbilical arteries, hematoma and also retrograde artery bleeding. And apart from that, not to forget, it's nosocomial infection. Uh, I think I'll uh, continue to talk about umbilical vein catheterization first before I will proceed with showing the video of both umbilical artery and also umbilical vein catheterization. So now we enter the umbilical vein catheterization. So the indication first is for venous excess in neonatal resuscitation and also for venous excess in preterm baby, especially in extremely low birth weight baby, less than 1000 gram, and also in sick baby in shock with peripheral vessel constriction. Uh, mainly this is for neonatal fluid resuscitation basically. And also umbilical vein catheter is used for exchange transfusion in the case of severe neonatal jointies. So contraindication is pretty much uh, about similar. Uh, it is contraindicated in omphalitis. This is, uh, for example, a picture of omphalitis and also omphalocele. Other contraindication is peritonitis and also necrotizing enterocolitis. So the equipment is also pretty much similar. We need a UVC set, umbilical venous catheter according to appropriate size uh, for baby 
bond with less than 1,000 to 1,500 gram, we have to use the 3.5 French uh, size. And for more than 1,500 gram, we need to use the cheap French size. And otherwise, other equipments are pretty much similar. We need a uh, 5cc syringe with heparinous saline, in which we have to flush first the catheter before we insert to avoid air embolism. So first, uh, the first step is pretty much similar. We have to clean the umbilicus also surrounding area using standard aseptic technique. Uh, although in the case of insertion of umbilical vein catheterization, uh, we are not quite worried about lower limb vascular insufficiency or lower limb ischemia. However, we should still uh, consider to expose the feet in term babies to observe for limb ischemia during insertion in the event of accidental arterial catheterization. And then we locate the umbilical vein in a fresh and untwisted umbilical stum, the umbilical vein has a thin wall, is parculous, parculous is basically has large lumen and is usually sighted at 12 o'clock position. And however, in a partially dried umbilical cord, the distinction between the vein and arteries may not be so obvious. So uh, in a, a this situation, if you are right-handed, uh, it's just better to stand to the right side of the baby. And then we should tilt the umbilical stum inferiorly a bit from the abdomen at an angle of 45 degrees. And then we should advance the catheter superiorly and posteriorly towards the direction of the right atrium. So here's the difference between insertion of umbilical vein catheterization and also umbilical artery catheterization, in which in umbilical artery catheterization, we would advance the catheter superiorly and inferiorly towards the direction of the lower limb because it has to go down first in umbilical artery before it then calls back uh, to enter the internal iliac artery and also the descending aorta. However, uh, in this case, we want to, uh, the flow of umbilical vein is actually upward from umbilical vein uh, via the ductus venosus and then enter the inferior vena cava. So in the case of umbilical vein catheterization, we should advance the catheter superiorly and posteriorly towards the direction of the right atrium. And uh, we should catheterize to the desired position. There's also a formula for the insertion length of UVC. So there are two formulas as well. However, uh, it was not mentioned which one is much more preferred. So I just say, I just present these two formula. So the first one is when we take, the first formula is when we take uh, 0 0.5 times to the UAC position in high position. So uh, it means that we have to calculate the length of UAC. Uh, length of UAC as I mentioned, as I have told earlier, and then times 0 0.5 plus 1 cm. Or the other method is by taking the birth weight of patient in kg times 1.5 plus 5.5 and also plus the stump length. Stump length. Where, uh, where, where did you get this second formula? From the pitch protocol. Is it? Mm. Okay, all right. Okay, and then it should ensure the successful and correct cannulation of the umbilical vein. Uh, in successful catheterization of umbilical vein, the blood should be dark red in color, and also the venous flow back is sluggish and without pulsation. And then we just take the label of the catheter, um, similar as earlier, if there are no complications, secure the UVC to avoid accidental migration of the catheter. Uh, okay, and and this umbilical vein catheterization can also be used to measure the central venous pressure. And in this case, the UVC tip should be sighted in the upper IVC, uh, near to the right atrium, the upper IVC. So in normal situation, in a term relaxed baby, the right atrial pressure normally range from negative 2 to 6 millimeter mercury. So uh, there is an issue with umbilical vein catheterization. Uh, and that is related to embolism. So it is mentioned that in a crying baby, uh, when baby cries, there will be negative intrathoracic pressure. And this negative intrathoracic pressure can be significant during deep inspiration. And uh, this situation, in a crying baby with negative intrathoracic pressure, with deep inspiration, they actually has a higher risk of air embolism uh, in this condition. This is because when there is negative intrathoracic pressure, so there is a higher gradient between the atmospheric pressure and also the intrathoracic pressure so it can uh, it can it can move or it can embolize the air uh, with higher risk. So we should be careful if we are to perform umbilical vein catheterization uh, in a crying baby. So post procedure uh, uh, if the UVC is for longer term, usually the umbilical vein catheterization was mentioned that if it is only 
for short term use, uh, we do not routinely perform chest and also abdominal radiograph. However, if the EVC is for longer term usage, such as for intravenous access or TPN, we should perform the chest and abdominal radiograph to ascertain the T of the catheter. It should be in the inferior vena cava above the diaphragm. And finally, we should consider removing the UVC after five to seven days to reduce the incidence of line sepsis or thrombus forming around the catheter. And these are among the complication. First is infection. Second is thromboembolism. Uh, third is related to pericardial tamponade, arrhythmia and also hydrothorax if you uh, like further advance it into the right atrium. And in the case of malposition, in which uh, we catheter it until it enters the portal vein circulation and we then infuse medication, uh, then we infuse medication, it can cause portal vein thrombosis, in which later on can be manifested as portal hypertension. Okay, so these are some my references. Now I show you guys the video of umbilical vein or umbilical atri transition. Okay, can you guys see the video now? Yes. Okay. So first, uh, this should be the umbilical artery catheterization. Carefully apply. As you can see here, uh, they apply. already draped with aseptic technique. Having an assistant and hold the cord. And then they tie at the level of the umbilical cord. And we're going to gently apply bleeding out. We're going to Before try and do a very horizontal cut, stump, try not to uh, do any angling, approximately about 1, one centimeter from the to one and a half centimeter. We will see. And then they'll try to locate the umbilical artery. May see some uh, bleeding and we need to visualize uh, the vessels. Very often there'll be, of course, uh, the very and thin as I mentioned, walled, the bigger vessel, which is the UVC, often at the 12 o'clock position and our two artery vessels, which are tiny. Okay, and here uh, they already prepared the 5cc string with heparin nice line in which we should flush it first uh, across the catheter to ensure no air is located there. First to stabilize the cord. And then they take a forceps to stabilize the cord. That helps hold. And then they locate the, the umbilical artery and, the other, and then they dilate the umbilical the artery passage. by using the here they dilate the it by using the forceps. Uh, and dilation of the umbilical artery is actually now we're ready said to insert to the catheter. Remember, we have flushed it, it through. It is the most but common again, we'll be taking uh, another look umbilical artery to ensure the most common that it is truly the flushed through and there's no air. Okay, and then uh, the artery just goes downwards the first before and up. The you may feel a bit of resistance. Sometimes we may feel a bit of resistance. And However, we no should continue to gently push it. Continue to insert it. Force. Until so our desired position. Return to insertion. And then sure confirm the presence return. of Amelika Atri transition continue by seeing at the color of the which is bright red. Okay. So that is it for the Amelika Atri transition. Now we will proceed with Amelika Atri catheterization. Clot identifying. Okay, so uh, assuming that we have timed the initial step, we have to do the aseptic technique, we have to the cut the umbilical stump and then we locate the clots. umbilical vein. And usually at the umbilical vein, there could be uh, some black clot, so first we have to remove the black clot first. Stabilizing. And also we have to flash again the cord. catheter to ensure that there is no air Insert. before we then advance the Insert. catheter into the umbilical vein. UVC should be directed towards the right shoulder mm, the UVC should be directed posteriorly and also superiorly towards depth. the right atrium as opposed to the umbilical artery catheterization we get blood return and then we assess for the blood return we successful uh, in the right place the color already. of the blood should be that right in nature suture and then they uh, secure and the UAC and also UVC by using suture in this method in this video. Catching any of the catheter, any of the vessel, I should say. Some cord, and that is also acceptable. Depth. Proceed to do suturing 
of each vessel separately to the court. Yeah, I think that's it about American being no sample catchy to visualization. Okay, the commonest problem with UVC insertion. Anyone has any idea what's the commonest problem with UVC insertion? The commonest problem with UVC insertion is that it goes into the liver. You remember the path it goes into the it can either go into the ductus venosus or it goes into the porta hepatis. Isn't it? So the commonest problem is it creates a tract into the portal vein. It creates a tract into the portal vein. So instead of going into the ductus venosus, it goes into the portal vein. And sometimes the problem with so UVC is usually bigger. The catheter size is bigger than uh, bigger than uh, UAC. Can so you you just 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 logic. If you put something big into a lumen, what what's gonna happen? It's gonna create the uh, it's gonna create a pathway, isn't it? So the moment you create a pathway using a large bore cannula through the portal portal vein, it's it's gonna be very difficult for you to create to to then. Uh, re-thread it uh, properly into your ductus venosus and then go into your IVC. So that's the problem. So when it goes into your liver, you cannot use it. Uh, the, the other thing you can do is actually just put a low low UVC. Yeah. But low UVC you cannot you cannot use for long, you cannot use for uh, for for many purposes. You can use it temporarily to give certain drugs. You shouldn't use for TPN uh, you can use just for some uh, inotropes momentarily. You can use low UVC for for exchange transfusion, but not for TPN and, and others. So that's the problem with UVC. UAC, the, the commonest problem with UAC is actually people can't thread it in. So but sometimes when you meddle with the umbilical, umbilical artery, it starts to bronco, it starts to spasm. Venous spasm, uh, the, 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 uh, it starts to vasospasm. So the moment you have vasospasm, sometimes it's very difficult for you to get it in. And then UAC, the, umbil the umbilical artery is much smaller as compared to UVC. So sometimes the commonest problem with U UAC is people can't get it in. That's the problem. Okay. All right, good. So UVC is the easiest. For rescue cannula, uh, rescue, uh, 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 rescue cannulation, in we discuss about neonatal resuscitation, isn't it? So the easiest actually for you to put is actually UVC because in during resuscitation that's the easiest. You can just put, put cut the umbilicus, put something in, just put low UVC. Then you can give whatever adrenaline or whatever rescue medication you can give. So that is why UVC for newborn that is the fastest access that you can get. Okay, all right. Mm, doctor, I have one question. Usually we do the umbilical vein or umbilical artery transition. I want to what age can the umbilical vessel be used? So usually we don't we don't keep it for long. So it depends on the center as well. Lah. It depends on whether you put a single lumen or double lumen. Double lumen is very expensive. One catheter is almost it's more than 100 ringgit. So sometimes in certain centers, if you put double lumen catheter, you just you can keep it for a bit longer, up to twenty one days. But most center keep umbilical lines for seven days only. So after seven days, you need to change to something else, uh, long line, and also peripheral arterial line if you if still need arterial line. Because the risk of in, the risk of infection and and so on and so forth, and then you know sometimes the problem with especially UAC, eh, sometimes you may compromise the mesenteric artery. So if you compromise the mesenteric artery, then if you start feeding, eh, some centers they don't they won't start proper feeding until you remove the UAC, because with UAC you may compromise the mesenteric artery and may uh, higher risk for uh, necrotizing uh, enterocolitis. So some center they don't start full feeding until you remove the UAC. Okay, all right. Next, who's the presenter? Who's the next presenter? Kabira. Saya. Okay, all right. Uh, how many more? So, Lihi, lepas tu? Saya seorang, the last. Okay, Mujo. The last one, okay. please. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, can you see my slide? Right. So, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, today, I'm going to talk about exchange transfusion. Um, so, exchange transfusion is defined as um, involving removing a liquid of patient blood. A liquid is actually a portion of portion, meaning a portion of patient blood and replacing it with a donor blood in order to remove abnormal blood components and circulating toxins whilst maintaining adequate circulating blood volume. So basically what you do in uh, exchange transfusion is you remove uh, the blood usually uh, uh, rich in bilirubin and so on and then you remove it and then you uh, infuse uh, the baby with a new uh, pet red cell. So the thing about exchange transfusion is that it's rarely done nowadays because we have an effective uh, phototherapy and in, page, uh, in mothers with uh, research negative, we give a uh, rogam and so on. So this is very rarely done nowadays. And uh, in fact, that's, that's, um, that's, that's, that's not true. Lah, eh? That's not true. If um, you're talking, if you're talking about other countries, other developed countries, then that is totally true. In UK, they rarely do exchange transmission, but not in Malaysia, not in Malaysia. We still Malaysia normally still, do it. And then yeah, it depends as well what you're talking about. Are you talking are you talking about proper uh, exchange transfusion like the one you're talking uh, you you replace with blood, or are you talking about partial exchange partial. transfusion? Because partial exchange transfusion is very commonly we commonly do it even in UK even in other countries they still commonly do it uh, because partial exchange transfusion the other more uh, uh, reason why you need to do it. Okay. Alright, are, are you talking, I, I, uh, will you talk about partial exchange? Uh, sikit. Sikit eh? Oh, uh, indication je. <laughs> so, um, uh, exchange transmission can be divided into two. We have double volume and partial volume exchange. Usually, we do a double volume exchange lah. So, this includes uh, several indications such as severe uh, hyperbilirubinemia caused by hemolytic disease of newborn, rate of rise in serum bilirubin more than 8.5 micromole per liter per hour, and if the patient has signs of uh, chronic thrust, such as hypotonia, lethargy, and so on, this is an absolute indication lah for you to uh, wait, wait, start. Wait, wait, wait. Chronic thrust is a post mortem diagnosis. Uh, acute so bilirubin and cephalopathy. Yeah. Uh, and other conditions such as septicemia, metabolic disease, and the IC. Uh, the thing about centrifugation is it is uh, the the decision to do a central vision can only be made by a uh, neonatologist lah. For example, Dr. Syed lah kan. Uh, not by merely uh, PITS, general PITS lah. So the contraindications, uh, hemodynamic uh, instability and sepsis because it involves... Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Again, huh? that, is, that is not true in Malaysia as well lah. Because the whole oh. country, we only have 20 neonatologists and less than half is in uh, government sector. So there's many, there's so many NICUs in government in Malaysia, uh, tertiary hospital that do not have neonatologists. In HDA, they only have one neonatologist. Obviously, neonatologists cannot be on call all the time, 24 hours every day. USM only have two. Hoshas do not have any neonatologists. Many hospitals do not have any neonatologists. So it depends on the center. What I'm trying to say is it depends on the center. So ideally, NICU should be managed by neonatologists, but that is ideal. So where I worked before in UK, in that one center, we have 15 neonatologists. So that's okay, but not in Malaysia. The whole country, we have around 20 neonatologists and more than half is actually in private center. So um, next is positive volume exchange. Uh, we mainly do this uh, to correct hyperviscosity uh, due to polycythemia and to correct severe anemia but without hypovolemia lah. So um, as a rule of thumb, uh, this is according to Nelson's Essential Pediatrics, a level of 20 mg per deciliter for indirect reactive bilirubin is the exchange number for infants with hemolysis who weigh more than 2 kg. But if we take a look at a few guidelines, for example the NIST nice guidelines, a bit more detail, uh, if, if you can see at the far right, on the right, right side, uh, there's a specific number, more than 100, more than 150, more than 200. These are the threshold number for you to perform an exchange transfusion. And uh, this is uh, based on the age of the patient uh, in hours. So I also found another um, table. This is, I took it from um, Royal College, uh, Royal, uh, Children's Hospital Mel Melbourne punya website. Well, I'm not sure he, 
kat sini guna yang mana? Um, we, we use, we, in Malaysia we use the the numbers in the pediatric protocol lah. Uh, in the pediatric okay, protocol, okay. They, we have we have a different number which is much lower eh, because incidence of uh, severe uh, neonatal jaundice is much much more frequent in Malaysia. I, I, I've seen babies die because of severe jaundice. So I've seen complications of severe jaundice in so many babies as well. So that is why in Malaysia we take a much lower number if you compare with NICE guideline and, and so on and so forth. So look at the general uh, the pediatric protocol. There's a set number. If you look at Academy of Medicine Malaysia, we have a guideline for management of neonatal jaundice as well. Uh, that is, I think, produced in 2015. Uh, so, yang tu pun dia ada dia punya value dia which is almost similar to the latest uh, fourth edition pediatric protocol. Okay. Uh, so, use the, the one in pediatric protocol lah. Okay, so um, the type of blood that you want to give to the patient in research hemorrhagic disease, we give research negative blood compatible with the baby's group uh, but if the group specific blood is not uh, available, we can give O negative blood lah. In the case of ABO incompatibility, uh, we use uh, group O blood, which is research specific to the baby's blood group. So we can uh, give either fresh whole blood, preferably irradiated, less than five days old, or pet red blood cell and FFP in three to one ratio. Uh, the volume of blood uh, for double volume ET, so we give, uh, the formula is uh, the weight of babies in kg times two and times 80. So we also need to add additional 25 to 30 milliliter for the tube in that space because of the appliances we use, that's that space. And the uh, aliquots, the portion that is tolerated for acid refrigeration is according to the weight of the patient, less than 1.5 kg, 5 milliliter, and so on as written here. So the preparation before you start performing uh, a central infusion, uh, we need to check the temperature and keep nabla muff at least four hours prior to ET and aspirate uh, the stomach and keep oral gastric tube and nasogastric tube on free drainage. And you need to have at least two people so, so that you can perform the procedure uh, safely. Lah. And the procedure need to be done aseptically. You need to have serial apron, gloves, cap, mask and mask. So investigation we have to do a few investigation before the, uh, the procedure and after the procedure. So before the procedure, you need to uh, order for serum bilirubin, full blood count, blood count chain sensitivity and HIV and HIV for baseline. And post exchange, you need to measure uh, the serum bilirubin again, FBC, capillary blood sugar and serum electrolytes and calcium. So previously, they say that uh, they recommend that we give um, albumin as well as calcium gluconate. Uh, so this, uh, this previous journal paper in 1960. So they say that uh, giving albumin uh, result in efficiency of bilirubin removal by better in by 50%. And they say that giving calcium gluconate because in uh, pet red cell we have citrate, uh, which is the anticoagulant. It can they say that it can um, conform a complex with calcium causing hypoglycemia. But recent uh, study says that. Um, there is no evidence that the practice of giving albumin routinely before adrenal acid transfusion confers benefit, as well as there's no benefit giving uh, calcium gluconate during an acid transfusion. So the methods, there are three methods of performing acid transfusion. We, we can use uh, continuous infusion using the UVC and UAC, umbilical vein and umbilical artery catheterization. We can use continuous uh, infusion using peripheral lines. Uh, this uh, is used when the, page, the patient has uh, conditions such as ophelitis or umbilical hepsis and serial infusion and withdrawal using uh, UVC only. This is what we call as push and pull technique. So uh, these are uh, among the equipments that we use uh, for acid transfusion. You need to have full resuscitation equipment. You need to have the laryngoscope, uh, ET tube and so on. Monitoring equipment, uh, infusion pump if you're going to use the infusion method blood warming coil, the drainage bag uh, used to uh, to drain the uh, blood, uh, septic, uh, septic ground gowns, towels, dry gloves, uh, gloves uh, the catheter, the scalpel, sutures, uh, and so on, lah, and the bottles for blood test. So uh, also during the acid transfusion, you need to note the 
the amount of volume in, volume out every 15 minutes and also the vital signs. So uh, I'm gonna play a video lah for this. Okay. Actually, I can only find the uh, the push push pull method only in the YouTube. Can find the the other two. Can you see the video? Can you see the video? Yes. Can you listen to the audio? No audio. Hmm. Okay. It's okay, it's okay. That's it there. Uh, so, mm, yeah. Uh, so basically, um, you need to have these all these resuscitation equipments to three way stop costs in the case of uh, push and pull technique. Lah. Um, yes. Uh, and then you need to perform as, this, this procedure should be done in a septic technique. Lah. You need to wear all those things. And then you perform the umbilical vein catheterization. And this is a two. Uh, three-way stop cocks uh, in serial arrangement. And then the proximal one uh, is connected to the drainage bag. It's where you drain the blood full of uh, bilirubin. Lah. Right. And the distal one, the back there, is connected with the pet red blood cell. So the first First thing first, uh, you're gonna um, drain, uh, take the blood first because uh, you want to give a room for deficit. So that you, uh, if you if you uh, it transfuse blood first, and uh, it may cause uh, cardiac overload lah. So you you take the blood first rather than infusing blood. You drain the blood first. And notice the direction of the three-way stop cock. And this is where they drain the blood. And then the second part is you're gonna transfuse the blood, fresh blood. And you need to take note of all the volume in, volume out, the vital signs every 15 minutes. Lah. So the ECG. If there's any, um, any, say, patient got hypotension or something, the, the procedure must be aborted uh, right there and then. So usual exchange transfusion can last for 90 to 120 minutes lah, which accounts for almost about 30 cycles of doing this. And that's it, no role of calcium or antibiotics. All right, so Uh, these are the complications of exchange transfusion. We can divide it into three: catheter-related hemodynamic problems and electrolyte and metabolic disorders. So, under catheter-related, we have infection, bleeding, necrotizing, enterocolitis, embolism, vascular events, and portal or splenic vein thrombosis, which is a bit rare. Hemodynamic problems: uh, we can have overload cardiac failure, hypovolemic shock, and arrhythmia. And under electrolyte and metabolic disorders, the patient can have hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia, and hypo or hyperglycemia. So post uh, procedure, you still need to maintain uh, the phototherapy and vital signs should be monitored for four to six hourly 
and for hourly subsequently and capillary blood sugar should also be monitored hourly for two hours and check the serum berubin lah for to, four to six hours after ET. For follow up, uh, order for FBC, reticulocyte sound, reticulocyte count and serum berubin uh, within a week after discharge. And you should also warn the parents regarding the possibility of patient ongo uh, having ongoing homolysis, signs and symptoms of anemia in which the patient has to seek medical care urgently. And for the long term follow up, uh, we have to monitor hear, hearing and neurodevelopmental assessment. Why? Because uh, if the patient has, pres, um, have, you know, have already acute bilirubin encephalopathy, the patient may develop choreoatetoid CP, and which may affect the neurodevelopmental assessment. So you need to monitor this in long term, lah. Uh, so I guess that's all. These are my um, references. Tolhi, back to your your complications. Okay, infection. What type of infection you're talking about? What are the infection risk? Uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. So not just that. So basically, first infection from the procedure itself because you're putting a cat, because you're putting a catheter direct into a big vein directly to the heart and things. So that's one thing infection from the catheter itself. I've seen. I've I've handled one one case. I'm not gonna see when and where. But what happens is when we were doing the exchange transfusion on the extreme premature baby, and then suddenly people con contractor datang by key icon. And we were almost below the icon at that particular time. So the baby then died two days later because of sepsis. That's one thing. The other thing is you are transfusing, this is why you call it as double volume. Double volume basic transfusion. Why, why, why is it called double volume basic transfusion? Times two, the 80, two times 80. Yes, because how much blood volume you have, even as adult, eh, is 80 mils per kilo. Can. If a, a one kilo baby only have 80 mils of blood, a two kilo baby has 160 mils of blood. Our blood volume is roughly around 80 mils per kilo. So it's double volume basic transfusion. So you are, you are removing double the blood volume in the, in the baby and you are replacing with double the blood volume as well. So this is a huge amount of blood. What's the problem with blood? Apa problem dengan blood transfusion? Acute huh? transfusion reaction? Acute transfusion reaction, anaphylaxis, in, other, other infection disease. Ada infectious diseases, hypothermia, ada sebab tu kena, kena ada warmer kan, blood warmer Lepas tu kena ada apa, you kena at risk of HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, dengue, covid Whatever blood borne disease, you can carry through 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 action transfusion as well So our our blood 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 uh, blood bank only checks for how many number of uh, viruses kan? But you know viruses they mutate Kan? Uh, apa, uh, the, sometimes we may miss the when the when the virus already mutated. So this is these are the things that you need to consider because you are transfusing a huge amount of blood into a small baby. So you need to consider whether the risk of infection is worth it or not. Okay, that's one thing. Air embolism, all these are procedure related. Why the patient goes into uh, uh, fluid overload and cardiac failure? Why? Probably uh, if, the, if the procedure is done by infusing the blood first, the patient can have No, the, the, stalling, the, stalling the problem is if you don't use the aliquot, why kita nak kena kira aliquot dia? Aliquot, uh, tadi you mentioned tak berapa macam nak kira aliquot dia? Uh, in general, based on the weight so, of the patient. So each aliquot is around 3 to 5 mils per kilo. So the maximum is five, ideally around three mils per kilo. What is the, how do you classify shock? How do you classify shock? Based on blood loss. So it's, so it's five, fifteen percent, isn't it? Five percent blood loss is already mild shock, isn't it? So when you're removing five mils per kilo, that's quite a lot. So if you remove, if you remove blood from the baby, 
in a very fast manner. You ambil zrap tarik macam tu. Five mils per kilo. Kan? This is a it, 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 one kilo one kilo baby. You expect zap ambil five kilo, five mils. Kan? That is a huge number. That's a huge percentage of blood volume. Kan? So suddenly tiba-tiba reduce venous return cepat-cepat. So and then heart terpaksa terpaksa nak 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 pump heart. So it can cause problem. And then suddenly you push five minutes. Zap, you push five minutes per kilo laju-laju pula. Suddenly increase venous return in a short while. So the heart cannot accommodate this huge huge change. So that is why bila you aspirate blood tu you can aspirate slowly over one cycle aspirate and uh, you aspirate and you push back blood in it should take around 3 to 5 minutes. It should not take less than 3 minutes. Minimum is 3 minutes, ideally around 5 minutes. So slowly kita buat tarik sikit, slow, kita push slow in. So the process is slow. Baru dia tak cause problem to the heart because large volume of blood suddenly zoop keluar. So your heart need to compensate. Lepas tu zoop push blood in cepat-cepat. So increase venous return, shock macam tu. So stalling law. So your heart cannot compensate with that huge amount of pressure. So this is the problem. I have seen I have seen baby goes into cardiac failure because of improper method of doing this. I've seen baby suddenly tengah-tengah buat tu dia diset. Pop 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 diset. Tak boleh tengok kenapa sebab tak buat proper. So doing properly is very very important. And uh, the baby can die if you don't do it properly. So this is very very important to do. And then okay, what's the difference between partial exchange transmission and double volume exchange transmission? What's the difference? Partial guna 80, 80 mils per kilo je lah. Times the weight of the patient. No, that's wrong. <laughs> so double volume exchange transmission, basically you replace with blood. You replace with fresh whole blood. Eh? Bukan packed red cell. You replace with fresh whole blood. Fresh whole blood maknanya, blood itu must be donated within 5 days before it's being used. Kena baru punya sebab lagi lama ada banyak WBC, so risk of uh, uh, reaction and things. Uh, risk for uh, post transfusion uh, 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 reaction, so very high. So the idea is use fresh whole blood, kalau untuk double volume exchange transfusion. Kalau partial exchange transfusion, you actually use normal cell line. So you aspirate keluar darah baby, you replace with cell line. Sebabnya contohnya, this baby has problem with polycythemia. You know polycythemia is a risk for coagulopathy. The child can develop uh, thrombosis everywhere. Kalau kat brain jadi stroke, dekat heart jadi heart attack, dekat bowel jadi mesentery ischemia, jadi NEC dan sebagainya. Kan? So, you do partial exchange transfusion. So, you aspirate blood, you buang darah baby, you replace dengan normal cell line untuk dilutekan dia punya blood dia. Kan? This is partial exchange transfusion. So berapa volume dia, you nak kena kira based on hematocrit. So contohnya kita buat kalau hematocrit dia more than 70 or in certain center dia ambil more than 65. Generally ambil more than 70. Hematocrit more than 70, kita buat partial exchange transfusion. And then kita aim. Berapa kita punya aim hematocrit dia. Dia ada formula dia lah, tengoklah please protocol. Kalau kita aim hematocrit, biasa kita tak lah daripada 70 turun ke 50. Sometimes kita kita aim around 60 or 65. So kita drop kan. So dia ada measurement dia, dia ada calculation dia. Berapa banyak kita nak reducekan dia punya hematocrit dia. Uh, so look at the uh, uh, measurement. So this is partial exchange transfusion. Dan partial exchange transfusion not just done in new newborn. In bigger children pun kita ada buat. Even in adult kita buat partial exchange transfusion. In which situation? In patient who have polycythemia. Apa condition yang boleh cause polycythemia? In bigger children and in adults. TRV, kesetnya Rufra Rufra. Betul okay. ya ni. Tertulis uh, terologi of file. Con cyanotic heart disease. Cyanotic so, heart disease. Patients with cyanotic heart disease, they are prone to get polycythemia. Kan? Because of the uh, cyanosis, uh, there's more RBC production, so they are prone to get polycythemia. So polycythemia is a hypercoagulable state. There's risk of thrombosis and everything. So sometimes when they when the hematocrit reaches more than 70 we may consider to do partial exchange transfusion. So even in even in adults, even in bigger children. 
so this is the sorry doctor thing. okay can i ask is it the same as venus cut down is uh venus cut down is venus cut it's almost similar tapi venus cut down is the process is the procedure that's called venus cut down mm -hmm. so but the but the process is you basically this is a partial exchange transfusion and what do you exchange it with you exchange with normal cell line Okay. All right. Clear. Anything else? Any question? Any question? Clear. Boleh paham? This is again. This is not ideal. Ideally, you should have seen the procedures, but well, there's no option lah. Nanti bila COVID dah settle, if you have time before your professional exam, come to the ward and see. I think even in even in even in uh, 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 Sultan Masjid Medical Center, we we do umbilical catheterization quite frequently. Like almost every week, akan ada uh, umbilical catheterization. Femoral line also we do. I think once every two weeks, kita ada femoral line insertion. So you can come and see. You can uh, tell us or or uh, the MOs. Kalau the procedure can call you when you can come uh, regularly to the to the ward. Okay. All right. Any question? It's late already. Azana. Doctor, is there anything like HTA? Oh yes. So we finally, because we were thinking of so many things, how how to proceed with the exam. So but finally we got the agreement. So we're going to have your exam in HTA Tuesday and Wednesday. Tuesday and Wednesday. So it's going to be modified long case. Uh, because we obviously in HTA as well, there's not many patients. So you actually can think what are the sort of patients yang ada lawat. You should know already lah. You should have an, a general idea what type of patients there are in the ward. And so a modified long case is basically we'll ask you to examine, do some short case and then we'll ask you to clock the patient in front of us. Uh, sometimes we may ask you to clock first and then only examine or we ask you to examine and then clock. It depends. But the duration is just 30 to 45 minutes. It's a very simple examination. Don't worry, we'll consider, we'll consider uh, that obviously you don't have enough uh, exposure to proper uh, physical examination. We, 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 not, we noted that. Uh, but these are uh, difficult times in the whole world. Eh? So we'll see. Okay, any other question? Okay lah, I think if that's all, let's end our session with Tasbih Kafara, Surah Ta'ala. Okay, Assalamualaikum. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr.